Hello everybody. Yeah, welcome uh, uh, to this last uh, Isaac and Uriel webinar of uh, the season for this year. Uh, this will be the last one because we will be having a, uh, a short summer break and we'll be starting off in uh, September again. Uh, yeah, great to see you with an, uh, yeah, a large amount. We've currently already 143 people in the, in the call and that amount is still rising, so great to see that. Uh, for today we have uh, yeah, Jurgen from the, from the Vlucht. I uh, have met him uh, at an, uh, the RIA Congress and uh, yeah, now he's also willing to, uh, to be one of the speakers. So thank you for that, Jurgen. He'll be in, uh, in, uh, giving a presentation uh, based on his experience as a previous auditor and later as an advisor uh, regarding uh, with a catchy title, Can you handle going down? Uh, so it, that uh, and in addition, uh, I can also have to mention a few of the house rules. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions that you would like to ask to him, yeah, please ask them via the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I will notify you and you can ask your questions to Jurgen uh, directly to have uh, some interaction. Uh, and finally, uh, mute your microphone and also your uh, video camera because it will impact our performance of Teams. Teams is not uh, fully uh, up to speed with uh, these uh, events. But uh, yeah, thank you, Jurgen. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, yes. Um, in that case, I'll switch over to the presentation post haste. Um, there you are. Indeed, uh, Jurgen van der Vlucht on this side. Uh, as an introduction, I, as already mentioned, I started, well, this was decades ago, um, in IT audit uh, from a technical perspective, uh, worked with KPMG, um, had, a, had a lot of fun there. After that, worked for a number of years with AB Nemro Bank, also as an IT auditor, and after that uh, with uh, various organizations, for example, the International Criminal Court, um, for which I was their IT auditor at large. Um, but by and large, I um, veered away from the just the checkbook audit approach and uh, started to become more of an advisor and uh, also moving to risk management more than merely audit. Um, as an independent consultant, um, I worked for about a decade or so, but um, found that I wanted colleagues around me with uh, from various disciplines etc. to cooperate both in the office and at clients. Um, and also, um, I was seeking an organization through which, with which, I could work on risk management in the uh, in the way that I wanted to do it and I as I think also the market is moving towards. Um, so I joined Marsh recently, February 1st, I, um, I moved in as a senior advisor in the risk advisory corner, again on cybersecurity still, but um, we're, what we are doing is very much risk advisory indeed. Um, yeah, the title, can you handle going down? Um, I can explain that a little, of course, uh, through the sheets, but also here already. Um, it's about the business running their business and the, what we all have to do, auditors, but also advisors, is advise the business how they can be as robust as possible. Um, bad things happen, uh, either by acts of nature or an acts of man. And um, nevertheless, the organization would want to continue their, doing their business. Um, and we as well IS staff and uh, audit staff and risk management IS risk management staff very often tend to take uh, take things from our own perspective only and i would want to turn that around and uh, want us all to work more from the well business perspective so that we can actually deliver value to what the business would consider value uh, indeed well this is program Short introduction, of course, uh, where I'm from. Uh, I said uh, what my intent and purpose is of this presentation. Um, why not to panic? Um, certainly over the last couple of years, of course, we saw an enormous rise, for example, in ransomware, etc. Um, that's real, but still, um, if, if we panic, we will lose it. And uh, it's better to be prepared to a degree that we don't have to panic. Um, in particular then, because as it says there, as three, the, the business, they would want to continue to do their business and regardless of IT and what IT is doing, etc. You can't put them on hold. The business 
wants and in many cases needs to continue doing something at least uh, in whichever way possible uh, with IT or without IT that's to be seen. Well, IT of course is a major component of what we all do. Um, also when it regards IT risks, etc. that we deal with. So I'll come to that and I'll give a one sheet summary, of course, in the end. Um, well, where we stood and where we stand, um, we have gone through the work from home motions. Um, a great many organizations pulled it off. Apparently, that's uh, certainly we, have, we, we are all in a lockdown and things in general worked out quite well. Some organizations had some startup trouble, but all in all, we must say, well, that went well. Um, problem of that is, of course, that everybody was working on this uh, lockdown uh, stuff. And well, the risks and the downsides of that were accepted in general. Um, but then that, that was a lucky shot, let's uh, put it that way. And um, there's two sides to that, um, one I'll come to, but there's uh, one major thing is also now that it happens that we all work from home uh, for a number of days per week, probably the most of us. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Jurgen, I'm seeing a virtual yeah. hand from uh, uh, Cor. Is it correctly, Cor? Do you have any okay. question? Come in, Cor. Can you unmute and uh, state your question? No, thank you. I was just uh, putting the wrong button down. Ah, okay. Anyway. And also, Schubert, I also noting a chat from you and a question from you in the chat. Schubert von von Zell. Yes, yes, I said I I heard Jürgen. Did I hear correctly? You're using the word cyber. Did things and opinions change? Um. Yeah. Well, th this is a practical point. Um. Well, Schubert uh, knows me from a couple of years back already, and um. Yeah, I did um, protest against the use of the word cyber, um, but uh, given that the world has changed, let's put it uh, mildly, um, I'm, I'm not against using the word cyber anymore. And it's and it's in my job title somewhere, so uh, I'd better use it in that way and okay. not protest too much about uh, my job title in the first place. Um, I'm unsure that uh, we'll come to that later. Um, uh, why that is and why the mix up. Um, but again, uh, coming uh, fearing back to the work from home, we are all pulling that off. But as, uh, for example, Gert Kogenhop, uh, business continuity management uh, expert, also states, well, what's your plan C now? What if, for example, the internet connections of your company would go down? Um, what would happen then? Would we be still be able to work from home, et cetera, et cetera? We've, we've used up one plan B, and what's your plan C to that? Um, and also, and that's the next uh, next item, next caveat, um, global society is starting to move on, and it was on all our sides. We were in it all together, but suddenly we found ourselves on our own again and facing our own risks individually as organizations. And uh, there we have to revert to thinking about risks the way we did it. Uh, for example, ransomware, it keeps on exploding, as said, and um, that ransomware is, well, not a societal scourge where everybody is hit by ransomware, although it seems like that sometimes it's your organization itself individually that has to cope with it. So also your organization, organization itself will have to find solutions to that problem. And also, have you updated your BCPs recently? because, well, everybody was in a lockdown plan B situations. Have you taken care to take up in your business continuity plans all that you've learned from that, for example? So we're, we're sort of trying to find out, OK, that was that, you know, and where are we now? Um, well, where are we now is that we see uh, a again a tick up on the sort of panic approach, the, the running from hype to hype, uh, the boy cried wolf idea that was too much around before the lockdowns. And um, we see that research a little too much. Um, and on the other hand, um, a, a lot of organizations counter to that idea of uh, the boy cried wolf are stating that, well, we've survived even the lockdown. 
So why would we worry about anything else that you come up with now, like ransomware or so? It's like, okay, we, we survived one thing, so we are very sure that we will survive just anything that's thrown at us. And of course, that's a very stupid idea to entertain. Um, and also uh, what I see in practice uh, with a lot of organizations, larger ones, also smaller ones that sometimes are more flexible, but still um, the business as usual, as we did it before, um, is moving towards a sort of an end of life situation. Um, we have standards, um, but it's really, the, well, the ISO 27001 originally in, in particular literally was like, was anything good on say incident management? Let's put that to paper and now we have that. Um, but it's all organizational stuff. It's all, you know, indirect management of the risk and not much on uh, on the actual content per organization because it, of course, it's always, everybody uh, uh, goes around saying that you have to adapt the standards to the organization, but that I haven't seen too much of that in practice, not to the extent needed. So um, that's where we find ourselves. We even have an ISO 30, uh, 31000 standard, but still that has is applied in much too much of a piecemeal approach. When it comes to risk treatment, for example, we have to, uh, we, we are talking about very detailed risks, very detailed controls to implement or not. So uh, that's not really what I see as effective in the future. It's too much what's called in uh, some circles risk management one, compliance oriented, if only we have the right policies on paper, then we're done or so. And then apparently we do risk management in, a, in an effective way, which of course isn't the case. Um, because we also very often tend to talk about the business that, that we service with our risk management, with our audits, etc. It's all about the business. But yeah, the business is what? Um, very often the business um, goes its way without taking regard of IT risk, etc. We all know that when it comes to breaching policies, but it's also about um, their views on business continuity and what, what they actually would want to do and want to be able to do. Um, one example is, for example, Toyota. A couple of years ago, ago, for example, they realized that their supply chain, in particular when it comes to chips, um, was just becoming too complex. They had a sense that it, it was becoming unmanageable and they saw a risk in there that it was getting too hot to handle. So actually Toyota for a long time had our chip supply uh, in order because they had uh, placed all sort of advanced orders, etc., and stocked their warehouses with all the chips they might need just as a precautionary measure, you know, and that wasn't because they saw that the IT, uh, the IT business was asking for more and more chips or so, or that there were signals from the IT world that uh, there was a chip shortage coming. They just from their own perspective, wanted to continue making cars and what you need is chips. So you better make sure that there's enough chips around. So for a long time, they were able to produce where other car manufacturers weren't. So um, that's an example of thinking ahead of what might go wrong and what scenarios do there actually exist uh, under which we need to do something else than we usually do. And that's uh, all that the business cares for. Um, and also, well, we have a lot of IT in many organizations, and I think that uh, over the past decade, it has, IT has become very much more the business as such. The business is running on IT, and oh yeah, there's there's all sort of other employees as well, but IT is the mainstay, the machine that the business runs on. Um, so we really have to cater to what their view is on risk management, what their perception is of what the risks are. And um, well, as we see in many cases, the first uh, risk that they, the business would consider is the risk to the capital invested, or let's say profit margins. Um, the business also cares by and large about people and uh, and also about technology. So it's uh, well, people process technology. No, the business is thinking about capital, people, and oh yeah, technology as a sort of last resort uh, for whatever, whenever then that would be more efficient than deploying people. Um, and so the business is also dealing with the scenarios that uh, they encounter in practice or in, in uh, theory. Um, 
what we're dealing with as IT style risk managers is then often scenarios where there's an IT angle and um, where there's an IT, if something goes wrong in IT or with IT or through IT um, that causes business damage. If there's no diff business uh, damage, then the business don't care. It's just for the IT stuff. You solve your problems, you know. Um, IT incident management, patching levels, uh, even, almost even to the level of ransomware. That's IT issues. You solve that for us. We want to continue doing the business as we used to. So um, that's really where the where the what the business angle is towards risk management. Take it from their perspective. Whether it's supported by IT or maybe even not yet, um, you have to always take their approach, their angle, put on their hat to see whatever we need to arrange. Also, qua risk management, also qua scenarios to be countered with just any sort of controls, um, which is what you see when it comes to scenario building. Um, there's a large part in there that we would recognize, which is the, the, the top part say the top half, um, though we tend to concentrate very much too much often uh, from a traditional background on the confidentiality part, including the pr privacy part. There's your typo of the day. Um, and uh, much less on the integrity and availability is well something different. Eh? Of course, confidentiality and integrity that very often takes a sort of uh, need to know uh, least, pr uh, least privileged principle at heart. Whereas availability means making available, uh, making information available as much as possible towards the business. So that's another angle. But the point is that the business doesn't care about CIA or something or what the specific risk example might be. The business cares about the bottom part of, through the availability, having all sort of costs to manage. And in particular, that, that box on the bottom saying increased cost of working. Um, that that really is for the business the most important part. What do we do when something goes wrong in that top half of this uh, picture? Um, how do how do we continue to do our business as as much as possible in the as much in the way as we were used to as possible? All the other things come into account. Well, and they come into the books as well in the end. Um, don't underestimate all these costs. Um, you might say, well, yeah, of course. If it's about privacy, it's very often the regulatory fines that come to the fore. Um, if it's about ransomware, of course, it's it's just paying paying up and then smiling all the way to the bank. That apparently would be the most cost. But if you really dig down into it, it's not only those costs, it's all these other costs as well. And per incident, it might not be that much, but the smaller incident, the less costly incidents happen that much more often than that. Uh, when you look at it from, a, say, an annual loss or an annual expected loss perspective, then uh, the finance department might find that all this, these little incidents count as well. But again, this is the business perspective. How do we keep on working? And what is the cost of this incident, regardless of what, uh, whatever Bitcoins you have to pay off? Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin uh, exchange rate has gone down quite a lot uh, over the past couple of weeks. So that's a good thing for us all. Um, so we might be able to pay even um, if things go wrong. Um, but still, we have to account for this picture. Um, if something happens, the bottom left corner, then of course, IT will have to do all sorts of things. That's the red, uh, red curve and have to put in a lot of effort to fix things. In the meantime, the business, the yellow curve, will have to continue doing their business in somewhat different way, sometimes having to revert even to manual work and doing in manual inventory checks, etc. cetera. Um, this sounds rather austere and rather um, out of this world, but a lot of businesses will be able to keep on running by and large um, or by running on paper for some time. That's also why this yellow curve at, curve at some time will stop. And you hope that then the green curve comes along, which is restoration. And then still many businesses will have to run and uh, incur much higher cost than usual because what was done manually before will now have to be put into the ERP system, into the inventory system over and over again from paper, etc. 
costs you a lot of overtime, a lot of weekend work, and a, a lot of errors to cope with, etc. From the business perspective, that is the cost of the incident, and that that red curve well has said IT might fix that. Um, one thing that I certainly joined uh, Mars for was um, this quantification part, um, which I think in risk management we should by now be able to do. Uh, quantification also of well, cyber or information risk and uh, scenarios and uh, damages um, has been around for a decade and a half maybe already. And the methods employed were around for well half a century literally. Um, and so we, um, we should pick that up again. Uh, we should do away with heat maps, etc., from which you can't really calculate, uh, seriously calculate uh, annual expected losses, that sort of stuff. Um, well, here's an example of uh, how we do it and how others also do it, I uh, can imagine, because this is the way that the insurance market is looking at your cyber risks. Um, taking this probably uh, probability density function, um, most likely, for example, in this case, you'd only have, say, a, a 60 cans um, damage per year. The relative probability of that is, uh, is like uh, highest. Still not high, but OK, you can expect that the order of magnitude of any cost to the business of incidents of this kind, so this is where this figure was taken about, uh, taken from uh, mal from a malware attack scenario. Um, you see that mostly the attacks themselves will cost you something, but maybe not too much. Um, but uh, we, as uh, insurance brokers, on the back end, we with Mars. Mars actually is a, is an insurance broker for, at heart, and um, what we can ensure is not these all these little losses, that's just operational losses. Um, you can buy them off in a sense as well. But what we focus on is that bottom part, that tail of the distribution, uh, where the damages are such that the organization really wouldn't be able to cope with them. The real serious malware attacks, the real serious ransomware, that's uh, in particular, that part can be insured if, of course, you take all the, the precautionary measures, otherwise your premium will be much too high. Um, and as you can see on the right side of the, uh, this uh, picture, um, even in this case where we are talking about a malware attack, there's also a uh, cost, but the downtime of the business, the loss of gross prof uh, profit, not being able to make, ship, sell stuff, that's that's the, the, the major uh, cost of the uh, major cost driver in this scenario even and there's other scenarios where this might even be worse say in when it comes to you know the, the balance of uh, which cost counts really well third party liabilities in here um, also from a business perspective it's you might say well we're a Dutch company we're a Luxembourg company but still if uh, if you're dealing with American clients for example um, and they are impacted by your breach or your incident, then of course they will immediately start to claim all sorts of ridiculous amounts. And uh, after negotiations, third party liability might still be an important factor in your annual expected losses. So um, this is the sort of analysis that we need to move to um, from a business perspective. What goes wrong? Where do we see all these costs popping up? And uh, how bad would it be? Um, given that as said we come from a boy cried wolf type of world um, you see that here too we will have to advise the client on what really will happen we will also have to advise the clients that sometimes um, the client will dismiss any scenario as being impossible um, quite recently we had a client um, who on the one hand said they were up to snuff with all patching etc uh, on the uh, so their network um, was impenetrable uh, the more because they were uh, a sort of a beta tester for Sidefix software. And uh, so they they always had the latest of the latest software. Well, um, given the reputation of Sidefix over the past couple of years, we actually had to increase the risk for this client of uh, having a network breach, of course. So um, you see that it, that is really a balance of talking with the business talking also with IT management of what could go wrong, how have you managed, um, 
what controls do you have in place? And even if you're nearly perfect, then still you have, of course, this tail risk of things that were that are highly improbable, but still might happen. You know, it's just around the corner such incidents. Um, and as said, um, given that the business, the business um, executive management will will certainly tell IT to go figure out for themselves what what to do about on the IT side about all these scenarios and about uh, putting in place controls, etc., or ensuring away all the other stuff. Um, I might have gone overboard stating that it's all about the business, but I yeah, well, cyber thre threats are real. It's not all boy cried wolf altogether. Let's be just be rational about this. And also we see um, various scenarios co come and go and wax and wane in the long, in the course of times. Um, now we have something uh, in what is actually Central Europe. Huh? Um, we used to have Western and Eastern parts of Europe. But uh, if you look at the map of Europe, um, the map of Europe runs all the way to the Ural. So the, pr the troubles that we now have in Europe are actually in the midst of Europe. So um, let take, uh, let's take account of that. We had just yesterday, we're talking with a client um, who also uh, has some operations in Poland, quite close to some, say, contested borders, let's put it that way. So they really had all sort of different threats that they had just a couple of months ago. This happens, but we still have to tackle it in a rational way. Um, and uh, of course, there's also all, uh, all sort of IT butterflies, you know, a butterfly in one part of the world ca causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. Um, we have these IT things as well. Um, the most famous one, um, a bit uh, almost cliche one, is of course just the one user clicking on a rogue link and uh, infecting all of the networks through that. Um, so yeah, that's really... Uh, what we are dealing with also. So we still should be vigilant and be rational. Uh, don't lose, uh, it, I'm not saying that you shouldn't lose any sleep on IT uh, incidents, but um, don't lose all of your sleep over and just every incident that might uh, turn out. Um, what we uh, should have, however, is this leading not only from the business, but as advisors, as risk managers, as even also as auditors, slash advisors, we need to really take this business perspective and take it from the objectives from the uh, that the business is pursuing and then seeing what sort of assumptions there are, what sort of boundary conditions there are, in particular the conditions towards achievement of the objectives of the business. What sort of risks do we see that these assumptions and boundary conditions aren't met? Actually, the controls that we put in place is to keep these risks in check and also controls to keep the risk to controls in check. Because um, of course, we also have to deal with probabilities that the controls themselves don't work out. Um, so that continues and is a really a field of study to go deeper in how systematically we have to sort of integrate risk management in IT controls, frameworks, et cetera, instead of do it taking a framework first and then seeing actually what risk we we try to solve with that it's it's an upside down uh, uh solution that we are often doing and we have to turn that around and really take it from business perspective even in it and um, that is what's called risk management too you know objectives oriented risk management objectives of the business translated again into it control objectives and then from that dive deeper and if you do that in a consistent manner and um, drill that down to even technical controls etc taking that all these controls are imperfect in themselves then in the end you will have a stable situation that at least you know what uh, what's going on um, you know that things still can go wrong but you also know how that would play out and you can um, both prevent that and control that even when incidents are happening um, well, of course, um, there's one detailed part in that that's particularly re uh, relevant for us. Um, as said, the control objectives control cascades that we have, uh, people process technology, that's a triad, but also the prevention, detection, correction part. 
um, which already starts to move a bit to the business. And um, of course, uh, the, the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, uh, five, uh, five entries as, uh, and below. Um, there's all sort of other frameworks that you could use and, and sort of shorthands that you could use, but we still have to apply them. And we have to apply them in a smart way. And then also um, not just take controls from from these uh, from all sort of standards and just apply them anyway, but we really have to map out what actually these controls uh, will achieve for us in controlling, for example, incidents, uh, controlling crisis. So then we see that well, the, the treatment part, the mitigation part, part really is focused on diminishing the frequency of the threats and the impact of, of the uh, on the vulnerabilities if something would go wrong. And while transfer share, we know and outsourcing again, um, although that's of course outsourcing the responsibility isn't outsourcing the accountability. And there's also avoid and accept slash retain, just not doing any business take it from the business perspective, they determine what they do or not, uh, and or the accept part where we still will need a signature of an executive actually accepting, of course, the risk, and, uh, and hence uh, accepting the accountability if something goes wrong. Um, those four parts still apply, but we have to be much more smart than we were with applying these and selecting which controls go where and actually against which risk they, uh, these controls uh, we put against and uh, as a sort of between the threat and the vulnerability. And of course, there's insurance, um, which actually comes on top of these four uh, because it's uh, insurance you, you buy mostly, apart from some obscure constructions that you can have, mostly you buy insurance, not as a control, but it's on top of these controls just to avoid the fat tail fatalities of the business. And um, if you have your controls in a, implemented in a smart way, then of course uh, your premium will go down. So therefore um, insurers will also ask a lot about very detailed sort of uh, controls. Um, do you have MFA? Yes, but uh, what sort of MFA do you have? Uh, what sort of accounts do you apply it to? Uh, where is it? What sort of technology are you using? Et cetera, et cetera. There's, I'm not saying here that you can just go around and pick some controls here and there, and then you're done. You really still have a lot to do, but you have to do it in a sort of sensible, rational way and have to uh, look at the top 12 for insurance purposes, for example. Um, there's one major advantage, for example, in, in at least about well, uh, checking whether, uh, whether or what your position is on these top 12 uh, controls for insurance purposes. All insurance companies um, will um, will have application forms that have these very controls in place. It's a bit like you know like applying for a, a fire insurance, for example. Um, then somebody will check: Have you do you have fire extinguishers? What kind of fire extinguishers are they? If you have nothing at all, then of course your premium premium will be much higher. If you apply these controls, then your premium will go down. Same goes for cyber insurance. Um, and as I said, if you, if you have too little controls, too few controls, then you'll have expensive insurance that just, you know, uh, uh, communicating there. And um, so very often we see that with insurance, for example, we do a check to see how you stand on these insurance controls. And then if there's really major white spots there, then we very often we say, OK, we'll give you a three month window before we really go to the insurance market and get you a cyber insurance. Otherwise, it wouldn't be any of any use. Um, yeah, well, as said, all, applying all these controls in a smart way, trying to figure out what goes where, etc. I think that um, this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine that we still need to do much more as a as a cybersecurity community about fitting out these sort of pictures. Um, it's not about the examples that uh, that are there, but I think the approach is a very valuable one. If you look at the top line, getting from the scene functions, where where down on the left you sort of uh, see a, see a kill chain uh, type of uh, of steps uh, being taken, 
and then across the board, seeing from skip action to increase the effort, increase the risk, etc. That might be control objectives, of course. Then reduce the award, the rewards, for example. Um, yeah, that's at many points we could um, reduce the awards, for example, of, uh, of data leakage and etc. Um, by uh, encrypting our data. That's a very suitable solution. That is almost a point solution in this figure of the total kill chain. But it it helps such a lot in reducing the re uh, the possible rewards for any attacker that it might that on other points we might have to do just that little less, just that little less on expensive controls, etc. So really, we aren't there yet. It's work in progress. Um, but uh, I think that this will be worthwhile to pursue as well within your organization to see where you stand, um, whether you can actually. Um, put all the controls that you have outlined in all your standards and frameworks, et cetera, and put them into this pic uh, these type of pictures and see how smart you are, are and how layered your defense actually is and whether the, uh, the objectives of all the controls together in the end are met to the, uh, by deterring any attacker from doing anything wrong and in the end uh, providing uh, making damage in your organization and to your organization. Um, better controls design also is about these sort of thing. Um, we need better controls design, not taking that only from the frameworks. Um, you all, you all very probably have seen uh, this uh, GIF floating around. Um, yeah, I pronounce it GIF, not GIF. Um, and we and we see on the right also that um, that that people in organization tend to take the shortcuts, um, even if we design straight roads and kind of nice controls and user access controls, as you can see on the left, um, then users will find a way in one way or another around those because they are, the users aren't there for you to follow your rules. The users are there they are, or you are there for the users and they will want to do their work in whichever way they will find ways around your controls if it hinders their work too much. So we really need to be smarter about our controls design. And also we need to design these controls in ways that are not straightjackets, that are not rails, you know, um, the straightjacking by and for the boss. And it's not about um, the knowledge works of today don't want to be straightjacketed into just following the railroad tracks or maybe switching to just one other track. Um, they want to do the work in the way that they find themselves um, to, to be best to solve whatever problems they have to deal with. And um, if you lay down these tracks too narrowly, too tightly and too much in one direction only, the users will balk and they will just derail your controls. So uh, what uh, what they all want is to roam free, be able to choose themselves which lane they choose, uh, which uh, which exit they want to choose, which direction, etc. And um, all you can do then is uh, paint the dotted lines and put some guiding rails on the side, of course, to the side and have some other controls um, because, uh, well, there need to be bounds in one way or another. What you see here, of course, is uh, you know, uh, the trajectory controller and um, well, we, have, we tend to get it more and more, um, but that helps. It still allows all the users of the road to drive within the limits as set and they may change lanes, etc, etc, etc. But they are controlled in a, in a much less strict way than what we just saw in much less of a, a by rails bound way than before. Well, and in the end, of course, we also need smarter monitoring than we do before. We need more tripwire controls. I'm not talking about just, you know, the, the security operations center or so, uh, because in the SOC, of course, they need to watch operational detail and quite some uh, detail indeed. Um, but we need more tripwire controls. Checklists are OK if they focus on the tripwire controls, you know, typ typical indicators of everything being OK. And only if you see this light coming up on your dashboard, then you can investigate further. Um, if you have, if you are monitoring all sort of details, then very probably you're monitoring form over substance. Because yeah, why are you all 
only looking at all these green lights over and over and over again. You need the indicators of when things might go wrong. You know, in not only the green smileys, you know, also need to focus on the red smileys and the, and, the, and maybe the amber smileys um, and, and leave it at that. And also then start to investigate where the problems might stem from and really investigate from that. Uh, it saves you a lot of time and it saves you a lot of trouble and it also saves you a lot of um, effort and um, feeling watched that the users uh, might feel uh, from all the controls and the, that you now have on your dashboard. Um, yeah, well, the dashboard then needs to refer to a heads up display so that you really can continue your business and are only warned if something tends to go wrong or if there's something not as it should be. And also um, all the controls that you monitor really need to point at things that you can actually influence. If you don't have a steering wheel, why would you, why would you have a dashboard in the first place? And uh, well, don't start on heat maps and uh, monitoring improvement on that. That's uh, quite another story. We can talk for days on that, but that's all sort of end of life, uh, well, risk management technology, put it that way. We need to improve here as well, be smarter, focus more on what matters and, and do less of just anything. Oh, by the way, this is uh, what the insurance then have as top uh, 12 controls. As you see, this, that is already quite detailed, but these are for insurance companies, the tripwires. If you score well on these points, and there's all sort of detailed questions below those 12, uh, 12 items, um, then that's an indication how you how you are dealing with information security. And from that, of course, uh, they see how serious you are with implementing the right controls, uh, doing the right monitoring, et cetera, and just managing in a right way. Um, you can always debate these choices. Of course, is this the top 12? Well, yeah, insurance companies have a lot of data about what happened uh, in the past, what went wrong in the past with just any global company. And um, so um, it's really uh, from that data that insurance companies have, have arrived at these 12 controls as being the major ones, the smart ones to watch out for when uh, when you would apply for an insurance, uh, cyber insurance, for example, then uh, if you score well on these points, they know you're serious. If you don't score well on these points, then they say, well, huh, maybe you should improve before you want an insurance. Otherwise, yeah, you buy the insurance, but you'll never be able to uh, claim anything because you're you're just messing up yourself. Well, and what about IT? Yeah, well, um, still, I, they lived happily ever after. Uh, that's a fairy tale. If you all do all these things well, if you do these smart controls, as said, um, you don't need to panic anymore. You don't need to, you know, you're aware of what you're doing. You have the smarter choices in place. And then you get also, um, when it comes to, for example, the training part, train like you fight, then you'll fight like you trained. You can uh, train and practice for example, your plan B and plan C and plan D approaches. Hey, I'm going too fast there. Um, so really then it comes down to, you know, business as usual again, if you have transformed to the smart choices, the smart controls, if you take it from a, those from a business perspective, then really you can go through the motions of training those scenarios, etc. Given that um, if you train like you fight, you fight like you trained, all those scenarios that uh, well business continuity will train that also it continuity management will have to train and and to practice and to uh, have exercises about partially and totally for the whole organization then you can be assured that if something really goes wrong that you have a real crisis it cert almost certainly won't be exactly like a scenario that you practiced but still you'll be confident enough that you can indeed handle whatever comes your way because it's not exactly what you uh, what you uh, practice but um, really you can handle it in a way you know you just know that you can handle it in the end and don't have to panic anymore so um, because you know what the risks are where the, the risks will play out how they will play out how serious it is, this is etc and whether your plan b will actually work or not so um, then you can you know, calm down again, and it saves you a lot of time. Times not lying away at night about oh, but what if things still go wrong? 
Well, that uh, actually is for my part uh, what I wanted to present. Um, don't go chasing after after shifting uh, cyber windmills. Um, the hypes come and go and they fly around and everybody was for the past decade or so was chasing, you know, uh, prevention doesn't work perfectly. So we will have to focus on having a sock, etc. Now we see a move back again to preventative cybersecurity controls. Uh, don't go chasing after just any fad or fashion. Um, take it seriously. Focus also on continuity of the business. That is actually what you're what you're there for within your organization, within your advisory function. Um, you have to focus on the continuity of the business. The business doesn't mind what solutions you present as long as the, the business continuity can be guaranteed, sort of, as long as you help the business keep on running even when things go wrong in a minor way or in a major way. So um, the last uh, uh, point is then to get ready to really do that for your organization. Analyze with that focus on continuity in mind. Quantify with that focus on continuity in mind, where you even might find savings, saying that, well, given the uh, ex expected annual loss, we might uh, want to focus more on another scenarios where the expected annual loss is higher and see whether we can put smart controls in place. And I have already encountered a number of businesses that we advised that really with this quantification, we could point out, for example, that they, well, indeed needed more controls here and there, but you could really on a quantitative basis demonstrate to uh, to the business and in particular to the CFO who does the insurance part um, that actually putting these controls in place, even if expensive, was a smart choice because you have a return on investment. Because you can actually demonstrate, and some companies have uh, have experienced that, that the near misses after we have these new controls in place actually were, uh, give such huge savings in, in your annual losses, operational losses, that um, it was very worthwhile to put in place these new controls. Pure, purely from a financial perspective already. And then, of course, well, when you have analyzed and quantif uh, quantified all these uh, all this stuff, you actually need to improve your business, have, have these smart controls in place, focusing again on the continuity of the business. And I might say, of course, for the for the tail part of the distribution, you, you can uh, still insure. And that is doable, even if the premiums are high at the moment, you can if you take the smart control approach, ensure your business against the really disasters that uh, that are around still. Well, that's it for my part. And um, well, not everybody's mic should be open, but the mic is open if there would be any questions from your side still. I'm not sure yeah, yeah, yeah. if anything came up in the chat or. Yeah, yeah. Dennis, uh, Dennis Weber, you're able to ask a question directly. Is Dennis online still? I think he has uh, his connection dropped, but well, the, the question that he's placed in the chat. After yep. initial boom in cyber uh, risk insurance, we've seen an insurance premiums increases massively and yep. uh, in insured, uh, insured uh, sums going down. Yep. Uh, the FD have published articles on this. Uh, uh, in your opinion, do insurance companies still have an appetite for offering cyber risk insurance? Yeah, or they do are have. They making it harder and harder for companies yep. to even qualify by the 12 IT controls, for instance. Yep. Yeah, that, that is something we see in the market um, as Marsh on the brokerage side, which isn't, which isn't risk of hybrid on the brokerage side. Um, of course, we see that too. Um, on the one hand, premiums rising, um, well, and, and, and the cost covered um, going down. And still in between that, um, well, the expectations about the controls being implemented are rising too. Um, although that's... Um, yeah, that's always a balance, and that is because very probably in the past the cyber insurance uh, premiums were much too low, because uh, just about any insurance company wanted to step into that. And we are we are sort of insurance company neutral as Mars, so we really go around and shop for the cheapest cyber insurance for you. Um, but that's also where um, 
asset, these, uh, these uh, 12 cybersecurity controls. Yeah, if they are key for all the insurance, um, be smart with how you fill out the forms, etc. that we have. This, this is all about, you know, um, filling out these forms truthfully and completely. Insurance companies don't want you to lie on the application forms. Um, don't state that you have all sorts of controls that you don't. On the other hand, we can help filling out um, those forms in a sense that very often to the very literal text of those uh, that is asked for, uh, by the insurance, um, you in all consciousness have to, would have to answer no. Do you have MFA? Do you conform to these and these and these and these American standards? Well, not all, so you have to fill in no, um, but you really would want to fill in also a large but, and we can, we in particular can help with that part, and then still um, you can get insurance company. It's not a black and white picture. It's not like suddenly these, uh, the insurance companies find themselves with, uh, you know, too many damages, so the premiums go through the roof and the, uh, you know, uh, requirements are, are also going through the roof. That's not really the case. Although insurance have been become a bit more hesitant, they are still, yeah, they're still insuring you, so you can take out those insurances still. Um, yeah, but uh, with the realization, indeed on the client side, that well, yeah, um, in the past it was it was easier to get cyber insurance, and uh, that has changed. It has become a little less easy. Uh, but we see we have seen that also on all other sort of other insurance uh, types as well. Uh, with other insurance types that's leveling off, you know, the rising premiums is leveling off, etc. The cyber insurance not yet. But still, um, if you're doing well, if you're really smartly implementing the controls, then well, cyber insurance is available still. Yes, indeed. Is that uh, satisfactory for Dennis as an answer? Uh, many so. thanks for your detailed response. <laughs> uh, he's remaining muted, so uh, he yeah. re replied. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No, I, I have a question, a follow up question uh, in regards yeah. to that. Basically, if you support in, in, because normally if somebody or, or, or a client will perform a self-assessment, they have an incentive to and to answer the questions to their own advantage, because sometimes they can be multi-interpretable. So basically, you you support in, you can provide support in conducting this self-assessment. So it will be not a self-assessment, it will be a mutual uh, assessment. Yeah. During this um, assessment, well, what, what we do is not we wouldn't be helping with filling it out, but we would be helping pointing right. out, hey, you answered a no there with no comments. Um, yeah. You might want to um, assemble some documentation on how you do do a certain control, for example. And the insurance brokers will um, sort of deal and ha haggle with, invest uh, with insurance uh, companies on behalf of you, the client, to get, of course, the, the well, that's a, that's the marsh part. Um, to get your premium as low as possible, and on the other hand, we uh, as risk advisors also help the client, saying, "Well, you feel that out, but really, don't you really have it? You you do have that, you know." So we, on on the basis of knowing the clients and uh, figuring out the scenarios, we also help, you know, with the improvement part. Um, well, okay, if you miss really really miss this part, you should consider doing this or this or that. That might help you. Being able to put a yes or a yes, a qualified yes in in those application form. In the end, it's still the client that applies and has uh, and fills out the application forms and signs truthfully and completely uh, filled out. You know, so that's uh, really like like the personal insurance that you have. You also sign the bottom line or, for example, your tax application every year that you apply that you filled it out truthfully and completely and. Um, this is the way that uh, cyber insurance works as well. But we can, as intermediaries, we can help indeed, um, not uh, say, say, stating anything untruthful, but uh, still can help, you know, uh, shape the picture, let's put it that way, in a way that uh, that's advantageous to the client. And during the, these assessments and the advice regarding any potential mitigating controls, do you also advise regards to 
uh, what, what kind of evidence will be sufficient if the insurance company would investigate if the, the self-assessment is correct, the controls are implemented? Does it advise yeah. you on uh, what do you need the evidence towards the insurance company? Um, well, in, in, in practice, that um, is, is um, we don't have to really, or clients don't have to really provide, you know, a huge file with all sort of evidence. We, we not often see that. Um, on the other hand, of course, when there's a yes answer, we, the follow-up questions, eh, the, you have top 12 controls, in that are questions and sort of real down questions as well. Um, there too, you very easily see what sort of, well, if you declare to have such and such and such MFA, then um, very often that's sufficient evidence that you actually know what you're talking about. And uh, of course, you can Google all the right answers, say, and fill that out. But uh, yeah, that's, that would uh, be literally fraud if you would fill that out and send that to the insurance company. So um, as it comes to documentation, we don't do too much on that. In principle, the organization itself already should have an ISMS, you know, in which all the documentation about the controls should be in place in order to, to you know, fulfill the management control cycle. So um, we, we don't do too much on that now. We're focusing more on helping the client giving the right answers in a way that helps the client get insurance. And on the other hand, advising them also. Um, that, that happened just this morning, um, advising clients about pointing out, well, if you have a white spot somewhere, um, do, do paint uh, scenarios, etc., and calculate on scenarios so that you can display uh, or show your return on investment to the CFO and have that improved in a quick manner so that after that you can indeed um, put a full yes in the application form and then uh, be able to uh, lower your premium, uh, sometimes quite substantially. So documentation, it's more for yourself as a client that you would need that, I think. I'm uh, also wondering, looking in the chat, are there any other questions? Because I'm seeing people leaving and they're and, uh, thanking you, uh, Jurgen. Okay, thank you. Uh, but at this moment of time, are there any other questions? Or can we call it uh, a night for the, for today? Uh, well, to you. Um, no, nobody's asking any questions. So, uh, uh, Jurgen, uh, yeah, thank you for giving this uh, last presentation for the season. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I'm also seeing uh, applause. So, uh, my applause as well. Uh, yeah, for everybody else, yeah, enjoy your evening. We have two announcements. Uh, the first one, we have the uh, general uh, members meeting on the 20th of June. So you can apply for that if you have any concerns or you would like to apply. And we have a nice announcement that the annual risk uh, congress will continue as we had a few years ago in the Amsterdam Marina. Uh, but that will take place on the 16th of November. So everybody have a nice evening. And... Uh, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye, Jürgen. Thank you.